Our guest speaker, and we thank her very much on short notice, uh, is coming to give us a presentation on Pharmacare. Uh, this is Robin Tress from the Council of Canadians, which we proudly support. So I will give the uh, podium over to Robin. It's great to see you today. Uh, my name is Robin. I'm the co-executive director of the Council of Canadians, as Kelly just said. Um, I'm just joining from across the harbour in Dartmouth. Uh, I'm glad to be joining you here on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Um, and I hope the rest of your convention has been excellent. Um, I mentioned that we're on unceded territories because I think as we move forward in reconciliation, a huge theme of reconciliation and uh, the land back movement is care for one another and for the land. And I think. That theme is also really present as we talk about pharmacare, making sure that everybody has the kind of medicine and healthcare that they need based on their need, not on their ability to pay uh, through an ethic of care. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm going to keep my mask on mostly because I am an immunocompromised person and the pandemic, unfortunately, is not over. <laughs> it's only getting worse. So I appreciate I Can everyone hear me clearly, though? Yeah. OK, excellent. Uh, yeah, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm here on short notice. I had very little time to prepare, but I'm very worked up about Pharmacare, so I hope this will go well for all of us. Uh, we're going to talk about Pharmacare. So Council of Canadians has been working on this campaign really hard for the last year, but it's been a, it's been a topic we've cared about for a number of decades. Um, in case you don't know about the Council of Canadians, I just want to introduce us as an organization. We are uh, an organization of members across the country and we work hard to build political power for people in defense of the planet and for our democracy. So we really use uh, an, or an orientation of community organizing based on people's needs and experience um, to organize powerfully so we can interrupt the really problematic relationship between corporations and our government so that we can get the things that we all need in our communities. Uh, we've been doing that for about 38 years and we're really recommitting in the next last couple of years coming through the pandemic and re, uh, looking at what we can really offer uniquely to our movements in Canada. We're trying to build power through structure-based community organizing and leadership development. So we're really working hard to bring people who are with us in our membership along. We want to skill people up for effective action. We want to apply our power that we're building together really strategically on core targets so we can make real political gains uh, as we go through our campaigns. Uh, so yeah, let's get straight to farm care. Um, I want to start with a couple of quotes from folks in our membership who have shared stories with us about their experience of not being able to afford their medication, what, they, what they've experienced with the lack of a public program and how crap the uh, public or the uh, patchwork of private systems that we do have is. So one person said, in my housing co-op, I constantly hear stories of individuals who must forego medication in order to meet the demand of rising food costs. It's not a just society that permits corporate profit to determine the well-being of its citizens. That's someone from Quebec, where they do have Pharmacare. <laughs> uh, another person said, I had to stop taking my migraine medication due to its high cost, which impacts my ability to work and further reduces my financial security. I am sure I'm not alone and we can fix this. Someone from here in Nova Scotia said, uh, my family, we're on the provincial drug plan, but covering the deductible takes about three months to pay off. We, modif we, we modify our plans, we do without some food, fuel, home repair. God forbid we need to go to a doctor's appointment or some other important need. Governments sadly don't give a flying turd about us, frankly. Uh, are drug prices reasonable, beyond the need for money for research, or is it more price, price gouging, as with the grocery chains and oil companies that have profited so egregiously through the worst of the pandemic? These are just some of the stories. We've got like hundreds, hundreds of these things. I'll share my own personal story. A couple of years ago, I did not have health insurance. I got a stomach ulcer. It cost me 300 bucks on the spot. I don't know if you've ever had an ulcer. It's not optional to get care for that. It is very painful and just, on a dime, one day, 300 bucks out of my pocket, 
And it was, it was a tough situation. A good friend of mine, I talk to everyone I know at this point about pharmacare all the time. I'm sure you've been in that stage of a campaign where you're bothering everyone about it. A friend of mine told me he has ADHD that he can manage really well using medication that's prescribed to him. And he thinks it's, he credits that medication really with his ability to keep a stable job, maintain his house and take care of his children. But it is $300 a month, every month for the rest of his life. He doesn't have health insurance. He works in construction. He's doing, honestly, the Lord's work of building housing for people, and he is constantly worried that he can't afford his medication month to month. So this is just the situation we're in without a public pharmacare system. I have a few horrifying stats, then I'm gonna get into the goods of the campaign. <laughs> the situation in Canada, these are old stats actually. These are all from 2019, so we can all imagine that as we've gone through the pandemic and as inflation, greed inflation is just rising, um, all of these are even more horrifying these days, um, I would guess. So more than 3 million people in Canada can't afford to take their medication as prescribed. So that means people are cutting their pills in half, they're skipping doses, they are uh, just not, not getting their prescriptions filled at all because they can't afford it. And of those 3 million people, 60% of them do have some kind of private insurance. But the co-pays or the cost outside of their insurance program is still too high. And I say this because what we're hearing so much from conservatives and opponents of pharmacare is that we don't need a public program. We just need something that's gonna cover the 3% of people who don't have any coverage at all. And so I'm pointing out, that's not gonna cut it at all. <laughs> I think we all know that. Um, but, a, but another patch on our broken patchwork system is absolutely not going to solve the breadth and depth of this problem we're experiencing. So three million people or more already can't afford their medication <coughs> point blank. Millions more are struggling to make ends meet, like the, some of the examples I just shared in those quotes. And it forces people into the really undignified situation of needing to choose between their groceries, their rent, and their medication. Uh, I think one of the major reasons for this is that Canada has the second highest drug prices in the whole world, second only to the United States. Um, and this is because with our patchwork system, we don't have the collective purchasing power we could use, we, could we would need to be able to drink, bring drug prices down in Canada. Um, something that might cost three or four hundred dollars here might cost only 20 bucks in a country like France or somewhere in Europe where they do have a pharmacare program because they have that purchasing power to negotiate with big pharma and bring those prices down. And something we've learned through our own research at the Council of Canadians is that since the beginning of the supply and confidence agreement last March between the Liberals and NDP, the um, instances of lobbying on Health Canada specifically from pharmaceutical and insurance lobbyists has increased by four. <laughs> They're meeting almost every single day of the work week with Health Canada to prevent Pharmacare from going ahead because, as we know, dropping drug prices would harm big profits for uh, big pharma. So, what are we talking about here? I'm talking about we need a program for public, universal, comprehensive Pharmacare. This has been studied to death. We don't need any more studies arguing for public Pharmacare. Um, but what I mean by those three words and why I keep saying them over and over again is it needs to be public. It needs to be a single payer system that is um, managed by the federal government. We need it to be universal. Every person in Canada who has a health card needs to be able to access their medication based on their need, not on their ability to pay. And it needs to be comprehensive. So it needs to cover the medicine that people really need. Um, it needs to be comprehensive. I was just talking to my cousin. I have a cousin from Australia who I've never met. I met her an hour and a half ago. And I was asking her uh, about what it's like in Australia. And she said, well, it depends on what it is. Sometimes you go to the pharmacy. Sometimes you, you, know, you can get your basic stuff covered. It might cost you 10 bucks. But if you need something kind of fancy or niche, it might cost you 400. And so we need a universal program that's really going to cover all of the major needs that people in Canada have. And one thing I love about this, <laughs> Demanding this demand, having this program, is something like a non-reformist reform, in that it would be a reform within the capitalist system that we have, but it would not be framed based on what is possible under capitalist means of uh, considering profits for uh, big corporations, but it's really focused instead on serving the needs of people based on that need. Um, that's, that's it. <laughs> um, when I think about what it would mean for our movements, and for our communities to have a public pharmacare system that is truly universal and, and uh, comprehensive. 
I think about people immediately, or not immediately, but like quite promptly, <laughs> having a huge burden lifted off of them. Being able to afford their medication would be honestly just so life-changing for so many people and would relieve so much pressure off of people's backs. But it would also be a huge win for our movements that would demonstrate to us that we can actually intervene effectively in the just slow and unending march towards centralization and corporate power within our government. I think to win Pharmacare at this point would be such a huge demonstration of our collective power and what we can accomplish, what kind of huge wins and real material changes to people's lives we can win when we work together. So I find this campaign really thrilling, both because I would never be put in the position of having to pay $300 on the spot again, and because it would be such a boost for our movements across the board that I think would help fuel our energy and passion and strategy and power to win other massive reforms, like for example, a green industrial strategy, other fixes in healthcare, uh, you name it, I think this would be a huge power boost for our movements. So I wanna give a bit of the state of play of where we are right now in Pharmacare. And I'm going to shamelessly just take off my mask so Angela can take a picture of me talking. <laughs> Let's be honest, we need the photos for Instagram. Um, so this is where we are with Pharmacare. Uh, we know that we need a public, universal, comprehensive system. It's been studied to death. The best report we have is, uh, was chaired by Dr. Eric Hoskins. We call it the Hoskins Report. Um, and you know, for over the course of a year and a half, around 2018, 2019, he went across the country studying, hearing from communities, talking to experts, trying to understand what Canada really needs for us in our context of our healthcare system. What do we need in a pharmacare system? And that's what he came up with. It really would mirror the Canada Health Act. It would need to be public, single payer, universal, and comprehensive. That all happened around 2018, 2019, and just before the pandemic, the Liberal government promised that they would introduce a pharmacare uh, bill. That never happened. <laughs> they promised it again in 2021. They've been promising to lower drug prices since 2015, and since then, drug prices have, get, have increased almost 30%. Uh, so, we've got promises up the wazoo, we've studied this thing to death, we know what we need, and thankfully now we have the supply and confidence agreement between the Liberals and NDP, which says one of the main priorities, show of hands, do I need to, does everyone, I'll explain. There's a list of priorities negotiated between the Liberals and NDP, and one of them is to get Pharmacare legislation passed in 2023. It's October 15th, <laughs> there's not that much time left, and so the clock is really ticking. So that legislation's due this year, and what we heard just last week is that the NDP have seen this draft. It's not public yet, it hasn't been tabled, so we don't know exactly what's in it, but we've heard from the uh, critic, Don Davies, and from Jagmeet, that the legislation they've seen is not up to snuff, it doesn't meet the standard, which I understand to mean it's not single payer, it's not comprehensive, and it's not universal. Um, this was very exciting. Last week we heard it was, the legislation was bad, the draft was bad, but uh, the Liberals responded by saying there's actually a lot of fluidity in this situation. Oh, the conversations are very fluid. Oh, we don't know. What, what I heard was they're not sure what they're going to do yet. <laughs> they are not sure what Pharmacare needs to be. Somehow, after all of these reports, after all of the stuff everyone has done for the last 60 years to win Pharmacare, they're still not really sure at this late stage what they're going to do. But I also see that as a huge window of opportunity for us to make a real push right now to make sure that we get the pharmacare system we need. Because we've got to get the foundations right or the whole thing is going to be a mess. <laughs> so the council, I want to talk a little bit about what the Council of Canadians has done in the last year. Um, we had 18 town halls and I think Angela, we've got two more coming in the next couple of months. So these town halls, um, my colleague Angela is here, she's the Atlantic organizer, or maybe you'll meet us after. Hi, Angela, thank you. <laughs> so we've had 18 town halls across the country, and we've tried to have a mix of um, the panelists being experts who might be doctors, they might be policy experts, they're researchers, whatever, talking about what we know we need for pharmacare to work in Canada. And we've also had a lot of people sharing just personal experience and their professional experience in caring professions such as uh, like people who work at women's centers, teachers, nurses, people with direct experience saying, this is what happens in this community right now when we don't have public drug coverage for everybody. 
It affects people's quality of life, keeps women from leaving abusive situations, keeps people in poverty, keeps people in homelessness. It's horrifying. So we had all these town halls, people participated, asked questions, um, and then after that, we really got to work. We got out canvassing, we went door to door, and something we found was pretty cool, we, we did a lot of canvassing outside pharmacies, because when someone's coming right out of the pharmacy, they've just paid money for their, for, for their prescriptions, it's a really good time to be like, hey, did that cost you a ton of money? Don't you hate that? <laughs> Maybe we can do something about that. So that was a really great way. We picked up a lot of new interest and support that way. Um, we use the town halls as a mobilizing uh, and organizing moment to push people into meeting with their MPs in really specific targeted ways. One thing we did I think that was really smart about this campaign is we realized there's too many MPs and honestly not all of them have their fingers on this file and so we made some really targeted decisions about how we were going to apply pressure that have really served us well. So we've got seven strategic targets across the country um, and not gonna lie, it's going pretty well. <laughs> it's going pretty good. Um, we've done in the last year quite a lot of network building. So we're working with folks like the Canadian Health Coalition, um, different levels of nurses unions across the country, anti-poverty groups. Um, something interesting is it's really hard to find patient support groups that are not directly funded by the big pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> so we have found a number of them and uh, we're working together as well as community advocacy, advocacy groups in all kinds of places. Um, a big challenge for this year that I think has gone okay is that we've really tried to change the media narrative. So in the last couple of years, the narrative around pharmacare and the news has really been, oh, insurance, oh, it's complicated, co-pay, co blah, 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 and it's like this technocratic conversation that I think that the pharmaceutical and insurance industry has really created because it serves them well for us not to understand what the conversation about pharmacare is. So they've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that when people hear the word pharmacare, we all just tune out <laughs> and are like, oh, that's too complicated. So what we've really tried to do with all of these um, folks in our network is change that conversation and turn towards people's direct experience, make this a human story, and uh, that's been going pretty well and getting some good coverage, and I think pissing a lot of people off in the process, which is great. Um, and then, like I was mentioning earlier, we've done quite a lot of research to expose the uh, influence of pharmaceutical and insurance lobbyists on Health Canada directly on the PMPRB Patented Medicine Price Review Board. That's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of really specific ways that some of the biggest lobbyists are just really railroading their own um, demands into the conversation and the decision making around pharmacare at the government level. So that's what we've been up to. I have a little video. I need to change this, so I'm going to just do it awkwardly. I will give a warning. The audio on this isn't excellent, which is why there are captions on the screen, but this is just a little uh, sizzle reel from one of our town halls that I hope will give you a flavor of what they were like. <laughs> That was a good time. 
Uh, okay, so I just dropped a ton of stuff on you. These are just a bunch of news headlines. I don't. I think we can. Oh God. Okay, we've been in the news. <laughs> Sorry. Great. Didn't I already talk about this? Yeah, I did. Okay, great. So here we are. Basically, what I've said so far is um, the current system we have is crap. The patchwork of private programs, private insurance that exists in this country. There's a hundred thousand private plans for drug coverage in Canada, which just absolutely destroys our ability to have any negotiating power on pricing. And that's why we have the highest, second highest drug prices in the world. And so that's where we're at. This is crap. We know we can have something better. It's been promised to us a lot of times and it's specifically owed to us right now. And as our friend Greg told me just before I got up on stage, I did not read the news this morning. I was planning to spend the day on the couch, but I'm here instead and I'm so glad. The <laughs> it's okay, I'll go, I'll go lie on the couch later. Um, so the NDP convention is also happening right now and um, their stance on their position within the supply and confidence agreement has really hardened where they're saying we're prepared to go to election if this isn't getting done. So this is a real moment that I think a lot of people have been working for for a lot of decades, like maybe since we first got Medicare 60 years ago. So legislation is being drafted. We know it's not good. We know people need it. 90% of people in Canada support pharmacare and plenty of them are dying because we don't have it. And so we have a really unique short window of opportunity to really crank up the heat here and escalate pressure on MPs. So that's where I'm gonna talk about next. So you folks, the CCU has already been engaged in this for years, I'm sure. The best, the most I know is that a couple of years ago, there was a huge petition out that got 36,000 signatures, which is quite substantial and I'm very impressed. And I know that to do that, you must have educated members, mobilized people through, um, through that. And now it's another opportunity to mobilize people through this final push where I think we can really get this thing if we, if we do it right. So um, I'd love to pitch, actually I go back. What we're doing, what the Council of Canadians has coming up, we have a series of meetings with MPs lined up with those seven targets. Well, we're still working on some of them, honestly, but um, we've got these seven targets, the health minister and then uh, six other MPs across the country who are in some combination, some sort of on side with pharmacare, politically, like electorally vulnerable and in a place where we have a lot of member strength. So that's why we've chosen these targets, but it's really working where we've been developing for about a year now, a real lot of pressure on the ground on them. And we're really trying to crank it up at this time. And I'm wondering if there are people in this room who are interested in helping. Any interest in cranking up pressure to win Pharmacare at the last minute? Hell yeah, all right, let's do this. So <laughs> I think there's some, I'd love to talk to anyone who's in particularly interested in any like rabble arousing after this. Um, I suspect there's some like rabble rousers in this room, but um, immediately what it would be awesome for any and all of you to do at this point as you're able is to circulate our petition to your members because we know that they already support this. Um, and let's be honest, online petitions are okay and they're a real good way to just connect with people so we can continue asking them into escalating action as we go. Um, and that's what we're gonna do. So we have a number of meetings with MPs set up and we're applying escalating pressure on them through phone blitzes and in-person demos over the next couple of weeks across the country to make sure that they're feeling the heat, make sure that they understand they're electorally vulnerable and that people really fucking want this thing. So <laughs> apologies. But I put our website here, publicpharmacare.ca. You can find our petition there. Um, and it, I would be eternally grateful if you are interested in sharing that petition through your member networks. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads and I'm very appreciative of that. So come talk to me afterwards. Um, Angela also has a number of flyers. Maybe we can pass some of those around because they've got these websites on them and a bit more information. So if you want to take a flyer, you can just pass them down. Um, all the info's there with our uh, website, which has all of our contact information. And then my last request is to become a member of the Council of Canadians if you're not already. I suspect there are some existing members in this room, which I'm seeing some nods. Okay, so thank you for your membership. And I'll just make a pitch to you to join now. We receive, we're a totally um, 
independent organization. We've never taken any government or corporate money. We get more than 90% of our funding through direct membership of people giving five or 10 or $20 a month or uh, one-time gifts as they're able. And this gives us just so much political independence and responsiveness to our members because we're not beholden to big funders or government kowtowing or anything. So, uh, yeah. I have no idea how long I've been talking for, uh, but I can take questions at this time. But uh, yeah, there's, there's information on these flyers. We can get more of them to you. I will admit, I only had like a couple hours notice, so I didn't bring a lot. We've also got window signs, but they just like weren't in my car today, <laughs> so I can get them to you later. But uh, maybe I'll leave it there and take any questions now. Okay, any questions for Robin? John, you have a question? John, and then Greg, Robert. Use the mic. Yes, use the mic. Use the mic. <laughs> All right. Who's got the other mic? Who's the mic here? Burke? Yes, John. Who are you? I'm uh, Sean Kane. Uh, it's nice to see you. And thanks again for coming. It was great. Uh, and it was short notice, and that's always tough. So. Um, I just want to know thought of uh, the differences between kind of, uh, let, let's get into sp uh, specifics here, yeah. because uh, the difference between kind of a pharmacare insurance program yes. and nationalized pharmaceutical program. In other words, we would nationalize the pharmaceuticals. And I know, I, I'm sure people think that's a radical left-wing idea, when in fact, a lot of the pharmaceutical research in this country is paid for by taxpayers yeah. through the university system and has been for decades, in fact. We had a massive pharmaceutical publicly funded pharmaceutical research in this program that was ended in the 1980s. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you wanted to talk about that. And, and oh, and two, if I may, if, if, if there's anything at the provincial level that maybe that NDP governments or progressive governments have promised at the provincial yeah. uh, level, uh, pharmacare in one province, I guess, mm -hmm. if that's possible, um, if, if you wanted to talk sure. about this. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that the idea of nationalizing pharmaceuticals is not wild, it's not wacky. It has been the way that Canada has done it in the past. Like you said, we used to have a really strong vaccine research sta uh, station, research uh, institute in Montreal until the 80s. Like This has been the way that it has been done in Canada, and you're totally right that a lot of R&D for private pharmaceutical companies is paid for by Canada. Like We all remember Moderna, like we paid for that. <laughs> we paid for that and they made billions of dollars. So I don't think it's crazy. I don't think it's a whack up idea. I think it's excellent. And I think that having a national pharmacare like insurance program is an excellent foundation to build towards that kind of thing. So the specific proposal we're talking about for this pharmacare legislation doesn't include nationalized research or production, but it's because it's a Thing that's already been promised and if we win it it's something we can't go back from it would be such an incredible uh, move forward and i think it would yeah it would lend itself well to a next demand of moving towards nationalized production as well um the second part of your question was about provinces so yes like so ontario for example did have partial they had a public program to cover medication for people under 25 and that was brought in by Eric Hoskins. He was the health minister of Ontario who later, after his term with Ontario, he was the one who was commissioned to do the study of what should national farm care look like. And the idea in Ontario was that it was going to start with under 25 and then it was going to grow to include more people over years. Obviously Ford arrived and now everything is bad, but um, that was the idea there. The reason I think it's so good to have a national program, I mean, I don't need to convince you, like, we need a national fucking program. <laughs> like, we need a national program. Um, but it would, in terms of the cost of medication, one of the things that I think is so important about pharma, a, a national program is that we're all already paying for this. People are already paying out of their pocket for their medication, for their co-pays. You know, if you have insurance through your health or through your workplace like you're paying for that out of your wages as well your employer is paying for it like it's costing everyone money at every point in the line 
And so it's like, okay, well, do we want to do it the expensive way where we're getting kind of like corner store prices for things because we're buying them 100,000 different ways? Or do we want to do it all together as 40 million purchasers? Your question was about provinces. I'm really going off script here, but um, it'd be better if it was national. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there were other questions. Two more questions. Sure. Yeah, I think I'm next. I'm, I'm Rob Stiles. I live in the Cole Harbor. I'm at uh, Sufi. I work on a seven uni and the CC. Anyway, I've had these conversations with my, my mom and dad for quite a long time. Yeah. This is my mom. She's just turned about 79, and my dad's turning 81 yeah. in uh, February. Um, we were wondering to know if there's any efforts. So I'm, I'm glad you come here today. It's actually just curious about this. Yeah. Like, right around here, this place. Yeah. Because it's not a good situation. No, it's terrible. No. And if your parents are in, they're in Coal Harbor, yeah. So one of our targets is Darren Fisher. Oh, Darren Fisher. Yeah, he is the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Health, and he owes us a pharmacare program. So. Oh, good. Yeah, give them the flyer. I will. Great, excellent. <laughs> There's some more of this. One more. Uh, great. Oh, sorry. Uh, Sean actually kind of asked my question already. Uh, I know we see we have PharmaCare out there, and it's based on your income. Um, so for those of us that earn a little bit more money, it's a little higher. But I really all I wanted to say was thank you very much for the work that you and the Council of Canadians do. It is much appreciated. Uh, this announcement from the NDP is a win. And we should take it and run. Yeah. Well, and I want to really express my gratitude to I'm sure many people in this room and everyone in the labor movement who worked really hard to make that supply and confidence agreement exist. Because without that, like that is the huge tool that we can use to win pharmacare now. And it is, it is indispensable. And I know that so many of those demands were so informed by real uh, labor leaders. And so I just want to express gratitude for that as well, because yeah, like that's the foundation of this whole campaign and we wouldn't be here if not for that. So thank you everyone for that as well. Hi, uh, we had a little from the York University Staff Association located in uh, Toronto, North Ontario. I'm curious if you can share with us, um, either on or off camera, the targets mm -hmm. um, and perhaps we live close to those individuals or we have members of our um, unions would do so and perhaps participate in some of the pressure um, given that it's imminent, so time is of the essence to do that. Okay. We got Minister Mark Holland, who is in Ajax. He's the health minister. We've got Darren Fisher, who's here in Dartmouth. He's the parliamentary secretary. <coughs> uh, Sean Casey is in Charlottetown. He's the chair of the Standing Committee on Health. Uh, Jenica Atwin in Fredericton. She is a liberal. She used to be in the Green Party. She won by a total squeaker and she's on side with PharmaCare. Um, Julie Darowitz in Toronto, um, Davenport. We primarily chose her because also a real electoral squeaker and we have members there. I've got two more. Uh, sorry, I didn't put that in my notes this morning. <laughs> um, we have Talib Nur Mohammed in somewhere in Vancouver. I can't quite remember. What? Vancouver Granville. Vancouver Granville. Thank you. Exactly. Um, so if anyone's in Vancouver. And the last one is... Angela's looking it up. Oh my god, I'm embarrassed. Sorry, I didn't drink enough coffee. Uh, no, it's okay. I should know this by now. Uh, hold on, I'll get there. Uh, no, I won't. There's one more. I'll remember in a few minutes or Angela will tell me. If you can give it to us, I'll give it. Uh, great, yeah. So yeah, so if you do live in one of those ridings, um, do talk to me after because there's lots of, what I've described already is the digital types of actions and the kind of, um, the phone calling, the letter writing, the, all of that, that's important stuff. Like it really does matter. The other day we had a phone blitz and we landed 450 phone calls to those seven targets in about 15 minutes and it was like, thank God. Um, but we're gonna continue doing that kind of stuff. So that can happen from anywhere in the country, but also in those ridings, like we need pressure on the ground. 
for example, a couple of days ago, Thursday, I think, Angela, there was a, the health ministers of all the provinces had a meeting in Charlottetown and there was a big demo there with like the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions and our local chapter and just folks in PEI in general. Uh, the Canadian Health Coalition was there, really putting pressure on specifically PharmaCare there because the minister was there. So there's these kinds of on the ground actions that will happen as well. So um, I would love if you would sign our petition, if for no other reason, then, then we would know where you live and <laughs> could get in touch with you about those geographically targeted actions. Thanks for the question. Uh, hi, my name is Amber. I'm also from Lisa. Um, so I want to thank you for coming. I have also um, been able to afford migraine pills in the past, so that in particular spoke to me. And I have family members who can't afford medication now. Yeah. Um, and it's a huge well-being piece you know, for all of us for carers as well, because I'm a carer or a disabled relative. Um, so the one of the, I have two questions, one that relates to another presentation that we saw um, on the uh, government platform transfusion support, mm -hmm. um, and that is they did an amazing campaign and were successful, but are now facing setback. And so I'm wondering what parts of this campaign are also focusing kind of on the distant future and how we can support those efforts, because I don't want to see all this hard work kind of go up and up. Yeah. Um, and then related as well, I'm curious about copyrights in pharma care because like insulin, for example, is so expensive, but that's a drug that's like what, 100 years old now? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm interested about like efforts in supporting that as well. Right, copyright. How not to screw it up in the future. <laughs> um, I think the point of the legislative goal rather than having, not seeking, we're not seeking a program, we're seeking legislation and so like, <laughs> feels like the strongest thing we can ask for. It's harder to undo legislation later down the road. Like the example in Ontario is that it wasn't a legislative situation, I think. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone from Ontario, but it was a, it was a program. So it's easy to cancel a program, but it's less easy to undo legislation that has like started integrating into the system. So what the Hoskins report describes of how it could happen, like obviously we're not gonna get pharmacare overnight, but the legislation would really set the foundation of requiring the government to make a single payer program that's comprehensive. Um, and then it would kind of roll out over, I think, seven years. So it would start with a smaller group of essential meds and then it would grow as we go. And so um, I also think that if we get that list of essential meds, people are gonna be like, oh my God, this is fantastic. And it's gonna be politically popular <laughs> to be able to afford your medication. So. Yeah, there are real threats that like a future conservative government could put on this program, but I think right now like seeking and winning the legislation that lays out a single payer program is like that's the best shot we've got, so we're going for it. Um, on the patents, copyrights, I think that, I don't know, my colleague Nick would be better at answering this question, but for me it comes back to the um, purchasing power element of this, where like if we were purchasing medication in bulk on behalf of 40 million people instead of as 100,000 independent plans, it would just give us so much more power to negotiate those prices. Um, and so it would just be more possible. I know like, even if you have, you know, if you know people with diabetes, you know that if, even if you have insurance, it can cost like 10 or $15,000 a year to get your insulin and all the equipment you need but with the purchasing power that we would be able to have through a national program, I think it would take those costs way down, even um, as we were rolling out the program. So, and then it comes back also to the question of like developing nationalized development. Um, all these things are kind of tied together. Thank you for the question. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Mark Christie, one of the uh, BC's members from the University of Manitoba. First. Thank you. I appreciate Daisy Sunday. So the fact that you to share your afternoon with us is very Hey man, we need free drugs for everyone, okay? Like we need yeah. a bath. <laughs> so I mean like work in the University of Manitoba has a lot of research. Uh -huh. Is there any value in our organization trying to sort of like agitate within the university or would our efforts be better spent at the provincial and the federal level? Some of these things. Mm -hmm. I think right now the best effort is spent agitating within at the federal level 
And in a province like Manitoba, it might be useful if you have that capacity and connection, it might be useful to try to minimize the opposition that might come from the Manitoba government. But honestly, at this point, like it's a federal game, like we're on the order of months away from this legislation. And so I think demonstrating that there is an electoral cost to not delivering on pharmacare, I think is the number one strategy at this point. But I think people at a university like have credibility, you know, like there's a lot of there's a lot of power there. But I think it should be applied at a federal level at this point. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hi, Rob. Not really a question. Just some feedback. Are you there? That's what I think. Just some feedback. I think right now, a lot of people realize it and starting to learn that a lot of Canadian money that's going into pharmacare and drug companies is that you'd spend south of the border. Yeah. So I think adding that a little bit of your campaigns also will click with people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we've been thinking about that a lot because exactly that and where, uh, it's so funny, like our public healthcare system is such part of our like Canadian identity, but in reality, half our healthcare system is totally privatized by pharmaceuticals. And so we're trying to figure out how to have that messaging really work without just being confusing or scaring people off. But like, frankly, half our healthcare system is the American system. It is private now and it is only getting worse. And so, yeah, I think there's a real like, I don't know, like we're on stolen land, so it's weird to talk about Canadian identity, but like there's a real, there's a real, there's a real heartstring to pull on of like, if part of our Canadian identity is this public system that cares for people, then we should care about this too. So. Yes, agree. Would love to talk to you more about that. Great. Cool. Thanks. Give it a swap. Thank you so much, Robin, for so being welcome. here with us. And Angela, too. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to say that we're proud supporters of the Council of I Canadians, know, and we're so all much. members. Great. We're all members of it. Thanks. So, and anything we can do to help out, great. Those names, please. Yes. Give them to us okay. and we will get them out to our affiliates and Fantastic. maybe we can help push this forward because we do need this. We need it. We need it very much. Thanks. Uh, oh. Again, thank you so much. We have thank a you. gift for you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, doing this on short notice Great. and uh, coming out here and not spending the rest uh, or the uh, morning at home. So. That's okay. I can go now. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so Thanks much. Everyone.